what he is doing is showing people that there is inherent value in human life. At 28 weeks, that kid has fought mm -hmm. for life. He has fought for it. Mm -hmm. He has overcome challenges that even the NICU nurses are saying they didn't think that he'd overcome. Mm -hmm. They didn't think that his organs would work. They didn't think that there was much hope when we took him in. He wasn't breathing and he had to be resuscitated in an ambulance after an at-home birth and a 30-minute ride from an ambulance all the way to St. Uh, to St. Paul Children's. They had they had as much hope as we did, um, and he fought. Right. That kid fought for life. Yeah. Why in the hell are we fighting for it? Ooh. Twenty minutes. You think that'll be enough? Yeah, I think so. Uh, not that we necessarily have to be in caucus at the no, you know, whatever, whatever. whatever. But um, so man. You're a dad. I'm a dad. How it's about crazy. that? It still feels weird, like hearing it. Actually, yeah. and it it was weird hearing it when it still could potentially be stripped away from you. That title, yeah. And not that it can ever fully be stripped away. I right. Mean, even if you had a had a kid and the kid passed away, you're still a dad. Yeah. But um, that was the fear first and foremost. But now it's it's setting in that I'm I'm a dad, and that comes with responsibilities, and I'm excited for it. Well, let's wind it back to. The moment. <laughs> yeah. And yeah tell, tell folks about it. So um, I've done the butterfly effect in my head of all of the um, the actions and occurrences that happened throughout the course of Tuesday, April 2nd, um, that led me to be where I was. Um, it was the end of the day, right after we got out of caucus, um, and I was chatting with Representative Ben Bakeberg and Jim Nash in my in my office. And um, we were talking about different stuff, just legislative nonsense. Um, and at the end of it, Nash walked out of the room and flipped the light off. He said, let's just go home. It's been a day. And I had fully planned on staying in my office for another hour and a half, two hours. I mean, sometimes you just lose track of time doing, doing extra work. And him flicking that light off, for some reason, I was just like, yeah, let's, let's get, get out of here. I can do it from home or whatever. Um, so that was the first kind of butterfly effect moment that takes place in this timeline. Um, I'm on my way home and I called my wife earlier that morning around one o'clock. I was like, Hey, how you feeling? You just had your glucose test. You were um, in the OBGYN and, and I know I had known that she had let them know about not feeling well, um, about having back cramps and not feeling herself and letting them know about that. And so I was like, hey, how's it going? She's like, it's even worse. And I was at one. Well, when I called her at seven and something, seven and some change on my way back home, uh, my mother-in-law picked up her phone. And so I was like, oh no, um, what's going on here? She, she said, Faith's in the bathroom. She's not feeling well, um, just get here quick. And so I did, I drove like a bat out of hell, um, straight home and I was, uh, I was, in the house for about 10 minutes, trying to figure out what to do. Um, I told my mother-in-law to call an ambulance because I didn't want to mess around with with this life, with my kid, you know? And you just want to make sure you're crossing your T's, dotting your I's and being over precautious. Um, and that's when they looped in another, another OB. And the OB had said, well, let's take this enema and if, if it doesn't take for, for faith, then um, then we can think about potentially calling up EMS. And um, I got there. Ten minutes later, I was bending over in my bathroom to help my wife put on a pair of pajama pants so we could get her to the emergency room. And this is a true God moment. I, it, it's too coincidental to be anything other than a God moment. My knee hit that floor to grab those pants, and that's when I broke shot. So if I'm not there... Mm -hmm then he's on the floor he hits hard my wife passes out onto the with her head up against the, the bathtub and things could have been very very different mm -hmm. um, but i just so happened to be there and it wasn't anything that i did it was something that that god did mm -hmm. um i picked up my son after what felt like could have been three days but it was probably more like 0. 0.3 seconds of me thinking that i was staring at it my, my stillborn son and I had zero hope. I felt completely hopeless. And it was in that same bathroom that a month prior to conceiving Everett, 
um, we'd had miscarriage. Mm -hmm. So it, it felt like a curse in that 0.3 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then I heard a cry mm -hmm. and hope was regained to some extent. It was still a very scary situation, but at least you say, okay, now there's, there's some things I can do to make sure that this goes the way we want it to go. And, um, my wife being as awesome as she is, she's done all the research. She's like, okay, right after you have a baby, you're supposed to put the baby on the chest of the mom, maintain body heat. Um, and it's a good position for them to be in. Well, there's only one issue. He's still connected. <laughs> we haven't cut the umbilical cord yet. So she is holding Everett or I'm holding Everett, but over my wife's stomach um, as she's on the bathroom floor and my, my mom who was at the house as well and my mother-in-law are in the other room and they come in and they hear crying. They kind of go into, um, into shock a little bit and I say, call an ambulance. They called an ambulance and for 10 minutes, I just held Everett over my wife um, on that bathroom floor, making sure he kept crying or took those labored breaths, which were very inconsistent, but he was breathing at that point. Um, or what I thought to be breathing, his stomach was moving up and down. So we just wanted to make sure that, that still happened. Um, about 10 minutes later, again, felt like 10 days, 10 years, 10 decades, don't even know how long, um, the paramedics arrived and I saw my wife and she started chuckling. And I was like, okay, is she going into shock here? What's, what's going on? Um, she was chuckling at all of the, all the young male police officers as they peered into the bathroom and basically went white as a ghost. They'd never seen anything like this. I mean, they've rushed people to the hospital where they would give birth moments later, but arriving at an emergency at home birth, I'm sure is not, uh, not something that these guys had experienced. Um, but once the EMTs and paramedics arrived, who were a little bit more um, prepared to handle the situation, they clamped the cord and I'm, once I hand over Everett, I went into my living room and I was sitting there shaking uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just didn't know what to do with myself. It was solely adrenaline and I just wanted to know that he was going to be okay. And I didn't have that assurance in that time. Mm -hmm. um, and they're checking on me and I'm like, no, 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 don't pay any attention to me. I'll be fine so long as he's fine. Um, and one of them, J uh, Josh is his name. Um, I have to touch base with all these guys because they were literal lifesavers. Um, but he says, Hey dad, come cut the cord. And I was like, in the moment, I was like, come on, no time for ceremony. Here. Let's, mm -hmm. let's cut the cord and get our butts to the hospital. But he goes, no, you're going to want to remember this. And so he was still showing me how to cut the cord when I grabbed the little scalpel out of his hand and went straight for it. <laughs> and he goes, Whoa, okay. You just, you just went for it, man. <laughs> and I cut up a little high. Um, and this is another miracle, um, miracle number two or number three after being told to go home, which got me there in time. And after being on my knee to, to essentially catch Everett, um, miracle number three was I cut that cord high and there was 10 minutes in between the paramedics showing up and Everett being born. That gave enough blood, red blood cell, uh, red, uh, red blood cell, oxygenated blood to yeah. Everett. Sure. So that he had the ability to to fight like he did, um, and so they rush him out, and my mother in law and I were following the ambulance or trying to. It was gone. We didn't know where in the heck it was, and we were told to go to St. John's Hospital in, in Maplewood, and then um, we get redirected. We get a phone call from my mom who says, "No, they're taking him to to uh, Children's in St. Paul." So we quick take another route and I remember in this car ride I was just praying that's all I could do um, and my mother-in-law was doing the same we just wanted to get to the hospital and know that Everett was still alive mm -hmm. and um, that was the scariest moment I've ever experienced um, and it, it will always be um, but we got there and I remember I was dropped off at what was the old emergency uh, room entrance and so it kind of goes down, it looks like something out of Grey's Anatomy or something like that, and, but it wasn't the right entrance. So now I'm completely lost and I'm looking around and I have no clue where to go. And I'm running around this hospital and it's a massive hospital for those who don't know. Um, and I finally found that entrance. And when I got in, I found Everett and they were hooking him up and uh, he, was, he was okay right there. I mean, he wasn't in good shape, but he was still alive. What I didn't know is that in that hospital or in that ambulance ride that they took him uh, from 
our house in Lionel Lakes to Children's in St. Paul, um, that he was resuscitated. And they didn't have a pulse. They didn't have any breathing. Um, so that's another miracle that they were able to resuscitate and it worked. They didn't have a breathing tube that was small enough for a three pound, 10 ounce, 28 week baby. So they used a human face mask, oxygen face mask, and put it over his, his little head to try to get something in there. Um, another miracle that, that worked to some extent. Um, another miracle being he was cold. His body temperature was cold in that ambulance. So his organs went into a state of dormancy and they didn't need as much oxygen and that allowed him to um, maintain some form of, of oxygen going to your vital organs. Mm -hmm. And typically the first to go are kidneys, liver, um, pancreas, those, those all end up uh, not working right because your body naturally wants to send your oxygenated blood to your, your brain, your heart, your lungs. But that night he started to, to pee, which means, okay, awesome, his kidneys are working. Um, and that was a really, really good sign. So that's another miracle on top of, I don't even know how many we're at now. Um, and since then, we've been in the NICU. Um, what day is today? Is today the 18th? Uh, he sounds right, yeah. Yeah, so we've been in the, in the NICU, uh, spending a lot of time with Everett and just praying and, and thankful that we're, we're parents in the moment. But that's the, that's the long and short of the story that, that led to all this. But I, I have to admit that um, I'm... I'm I'm drawing strength from my wife mm -hmm. and from Everett. Mm -hmm. It's not the other way around. I thought that I was going to kind of be a rock in the situation. Yeah, yeah, this, right. Yeah. You're, it's completely out of your hands. And so you have to you have to trust that there is a big picture that I'm not privy to mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that it's going to work out. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. Well, I'll tell people along those lines, tell people about from Faith's perspective – you know, the, all, everything that you've described, obviously, she's right. going through as well from her perspective. But talk about how she handled it, because I think this part of the story. This is, is the biggest part of the story. Um, thanks for reminding me. So she, she was rushed in a different ambulance to United, which is connected to Children's Hospital. And um, you can obviously imagine how scared a normal person would be not being with their baby after it's born prematurely at home emergency birth and you don't know anything you have no information mm -hmm. um, she was asked by one of the um, one of the medics that was with her in the ambulance hey how are you doing physically and mentally you're like, like talk me through how you're feeling because we want to make sure that you're mentally okay and she, her exact words I mean she's living up to her name to the nth degree in this moment she says it's in, it's in God's hands Jesus has got him I have to trust that and we've heard people say that, mm -hmm. but in a moment like that, to say it with conviction right. and to actually believe it right. Right. is a whole new ballgame. And they didn't, they were so shocked. Yeah. They all started going on. Yeah. Um, and she's like, what's, what's going on? And one of the, one of the guys that was in the ambulance with her looked at one of the other uh, EMTs and goes, did you give her any drugs? Like, yeah, is she right. sedated? Is she a little loopy right now? And they're like, we haven't given her anything. Yeah. <laughs> so that, um, that to me is a, a testament to just how strong she is. Yeah, it, it reminds me, and, and it's, the example I'm about to give is more dramatic, <clears throat> but I think categorically similar in the, in the book of Job, where Job reaches that rock bottom point where he's lost everything. Yep. And he tears his robe and, you know, he puts on and set cloth and ashes and all that stuff. And he falls to the ground and the, and the scripture says, and he worshiped. And that's when you talk about people having that moment of truly you can tell they're turning something over to God. Yes. It, it, in a way that is not natural. Correct. It is not natural to the flesh to have that kind of faith to physically absolve yourself of something that you know you have no power in right and giving it to god yeah when you've done that and it took me it took me some time sure for faith to have done that in the manner that she did showed me that you're able to do it right um but 
it, I, I'm an action-oriented person. I know I've said this to you. It was one of my pet peeves hearing in the past. It's in God's hands. Right. Because that always, for me, it felt as if it was a saying that people would use when they wanted to absolve themselves of, of responsibility. And th- they wanted to just say, okay, well, I, I'm going to throw my hands up. I'm done with it. Let's let, let's let God deal with it. Well, I always thought, no, he gave us hands. We're supposed to use them for his glory. But that was a true instance of humble pie where I said, no, I don't have hands that are capable of doing this. He does. Mm-hmm. Um, and that took some time, but after about 48 hours of no sleep and staring at monitors and realizing that even if I saw something on the monitor, I couldn't change it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when I came to that conclusion, but faith was like that. Well, and it's something that we hear when there's tragedies that happen that make headlines. Yeah. You see people offer thoughts and prayers right. and in recent years, that's been frequently mocked. It has. It has been mocked. As being somehow uh, inadequate. Which is ridiculous. But the point that I like to make in those moments is that, yeah, it, it is inadequate. That's why we're doing it. Right. Because we are inadequate. We are because inadequate. Human beings cannot rise to this task. Correct. Therefore, we're turning our faith to the Lord who made us to intervene and to and to play his role. And you know, it, it is it is a there is a balance there because you're absolutely right. It can be used as a cop out, right, for not taking action that is within your scope and that is God willed. Yeah. Um, but the moment you have that, you know, Moses striking the rock and saying, "Look what I did for you." Right. You know, so like right. what's what's it gets to that point where you're taking responsibility for something that is not is not yours to, to take. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's like it can be a bit of a moral tightrope to walk, hundred um, percent. But it, it's I think it's important to to walk it and to not fall on one side or the other. And the, I'll, I'll never use that as a as a um, pet peeve again. I'll never see it as something that's stereotypical because there are times in which you have to trust in Him. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to trust in Him always, but. In a time like that, when you hit your knees and you worship and you plead and you, you're hoping yep. beyond hope that that your son's still alive, mm-hmm. there there is nothing that I can do um, other than trust that he has a plan that I'm not privy to. Mm-hmm. And I think that that you bring up a really good point. The fact that that's been mocked mm-hmm. in recent times that's been interesting to watch because a lot of people say the thoughts and prayers are awesome. Time for action. Right. And like right. that's kind of the same. It's kind yeah, of yeah. getting at the same testament to what I was um, calling my, my pet peeve. But we felt the prayers. Yeah. We yeah. felt them. And, um, I mean, we're two of them are gathered, right? Mm-hmm. But this was an instance in which Representative Marion O'Neill, or Re- Marion Rarick, rather. Yeah. After getting married. Um, She's got to be so irritated by that. Because uh, we all keep, we all keep <laughs> doing it, and I feel so bad. But it was it was so crazy when she came up to me, and it was um, Tuesday he was born. Thursday, I came in for a little bit. My wife, I think this is her nice way of saying, go get out of my hair. Like, yeah, go yeah. do something right. normal because yeah. you're worrying too much. I came to the house and I was voting for a little bit. And she goes, at 934, I remember feeling something. Like, yeah. I had to hit my knees and pray. Mm-hmm. And in a separate conversation with Roger Scrava, he started tearing up. And Roger's, he's a pretty jovial guy. Mm-hmm. He's happy-go-lucky. He's a great guy. Um, and I've never seen him kind of shaken with emotion. Mm-hmm. He did the same thing. So 934, I go, like, what What was going on in 934? Mm-hmm. That was when they were hooking him up to the oxygen and seeing if he'd take it. Mm-hmm. Like, that to me is straight from a realm that we're not, we're not aware of yet. Why did two reps who don't hang out together, they don't run around in the same circles, why did they both hit their knees at 934 and feel something? Mm-hmm. Um, we, we need to recognize that there is something bigger than humans. We're not, we are not capable of fixing everything. If we were, then these past two sessions, we would have fixed a lot and we've only created more problems, right? Everybody worships somebody. Either you worship Christ or you worship yourself. Mm. And doing the latter is a recipe for disaster. And um, I think in a lot of ways this, I mean, obviously it's still ever-changing and we're still hoping for really good results with Everett's brain scans and, and brain bleed and stuff like that. But this has been a testimony to just how much he can do um, when you recognize you can't do anything. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's what I've taken out of this. And I think that's a really good lesson for any parent who's 
experience the same feeling and they have in some way, shape, or form. Maybe not in the first couple minutes of life, but they're, uh, I'm sure that there are 95% plus of parents that say there have been times where I felt powerless. And um, that was uh, that was my feeling. So, so we're 16 days yeah. now. Yeah. And obviously your focus rightly and properly has been on the health and well-being and enjoyment of your family. Right. At some point, your, your brain starts to kick back into occupational mode. You're thinking about issues. You're thinking about public service. You're you think about, about duty. You think, you think about, about duty. legacy. Yeah. This is Everett's legacy. I mean, first off, it, it, the first 24 to 48 hours of his life could be made into a three-part movie. Sure. Um, but it also needs to be shared not because of my own position as a rep or position of public policy work. That, that's beside the point. What he is doing is showing people that there is inherent value in human life. At 28 weeks, that kid has fought mm -hmm. for life. He has fought for it. Mm -hmm. He has overcome challenges that even the NICU nurses are saying they didn't think that he'd overcome. Mm -hmm. They didn't think that his organs would work. They didn't think that there was much hope when we took him in. He wasn't breathing and he had to be resuscitated in an ambulance after an at-home birth and a 30-minute ride from the ambulance all the way to St. Uh, to St. Paul Children's. They had they had as much hope as we did. Um, and he fought. Right. That kid fought for life. Yeah. Why in the hell are we fighting for it? Ooh. Why in the hell are we fighting for it? I appreciate the fact that Democrats are reaching out and saying, um, my thoughts and prayers are with you. I want their vote to be with us on this too. It's time that they start recognizing that there's an inherent value in life and that he isn't a choice. He, he, he wasn't choosing whether or not he was going to stick around. He was fighting for it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that anybody who's been in this position recognizes just how, just how precious life is. And let's... I mean, it, I, I, I want to be careful in how I talk about it, not because uh, out of some sort of sensitivity for people's feelings in the general sense, right? but out of respect for him personally and for no, your family. Just speak, speak, um, well, I mean, man. I mean, that's where we're at right but now. But he was born at 29 weeks. 28, 28, 28, weeks. exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you are talking about your 28 gestational age yeah. week son yeah. fighting for life. Yes. Okay. Um, we let's... have on the books right now a 40 week, um, any reason, any time yeah. to an unlicensed abortion provider. I love how they love, they love changing up language and, and making it sound as if it's healthcare. Yeah. Um, it's not. This has been a real eye opener for me and just how extreme. I mean, I knew it was an extreme policies that they were passing and we're in line with North Korea and China as the only states in the nation that allow for elected abortion. Most permissive in the world. Correct. But to, to say that there's no inherent value in, in something that's already fighting for life, that's already yeah. sucking its thumb. Um, I mean, he's sucking his thumb right now. Yeah. He's eating. He gets fussy when there's too many people in a room. His heart yeah. rate starts going up. Yeah. I mean, you saw that. I mean, you were in you were in on uh, Saturday, and it was funny. We still use the line to quote, "My gosh, look at that! 200 beats per minute. He's like a little hummingbird." <laughs> um, it, that that was funny, but it, he's fighting. Mm -hmm. And imagine a 40 week baby being denied that. That's what's so crazy to me, and beyond. I mean, they're 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 saying that if you elect to terminate um, you can do so after birth that's so extreme and I mean, how we haven't shared these types of of occurrences in the past as a party is a little bit um, it's disappointing to me because we're all here because of that fight we're all here because somebody allowed us to have mm -hmm. that opportunity mm -hmm. and to deprive somebody of that opportunity and call it righteous right. and to call it moral and to right. call it compassionate right. is, uh, it, it's perverse. So Yeah, it very much is. And, and just to put a fine point on it, 
No one, not one person anywhere, contests the humanity of Everett Dinkin. Right. In his current born, yep. thriving form. Yep. And yet he should still be in the womb. That and child. Deprive him of him then. That child, if still in his <laughs> mother, yep. would be eligible for legal termination yeah. under current Minnesota law. That's what's so that's what's so sad about it too. I mean, um, what changed? Nothing. Nothing. Residence, right? Uh, oxygen. It was a, it was a, a, a shift in residence. Yep, seventy two percent nitrogen. I mean, given, oxygen was the only thing that changed. Well, and it was given oxygen just through another means. Yep, through a tube. Same yeah. being, same uh-huh. creature. Um, but it wasn't on the inside, right? And, and so it's we we're we're in a weird moment right now. We had uh, we had what's uh, called the Ranger Party yeah. um, here in St. Paul yesterday and I was talking to a couple of gals and issues came up and this was one of the issues that came up. The abortion issue. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I had had another conversation with a guy earlier in the day and they were all of the same opinion that and by the way, our people. Okay. Yeah, Republicans who think that we should take a different stance on abortion. Yep. Or electoral they, were, they were all of that of that opinion that this is something we cannot be talking about. This is ridiculous to just walk away from. And I, okay, but if we do that, yeah. then- What hell are you willing to die on? Right. We don't have a moral basis for talking about literally anything. Well, look at Bill Maher last week, Friday night, he was talking about yes. the abortion issue. He said- he has respect, and he can understand where where um, absolutists or absolutists on, on abortion come from. They believe it's murder. He he said that he agrees with that that it is murder, but it's murder that he's okay with. He kind of said the quiet he, part. He of did it. yes, explicitly. Um, explicitly. I mean, I, I, I guess I'll give him kudos for being truthful to his audience. But how how are you supposed to respect the fact that somebody can see that and still say it's okay? Right. Um, let alone at this at this gestational age. Um, and I understand that this is this is a deeply personal um, and and a, a tough position to grapple with. It's one of those issues that will go down as a, 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 an issue of, of question for forever, right? It's kind of a, a moral dilemma for a lot of people. But Everett isn't a moral, moral dilemma. Like you said, yes. I have Democrats that are reaching out, I have Republicans that are reaching out, I have people that are completely apolitical and never followed politics a day in their life that are saying it's so awesome to see that he's doing as well as he is um, for the, the situations that he was presented. Um, and his and, value, uh, yes, his value does not come from the fact that you guys want him. Right. Right. Um, you, you guys did not declare yeah. as if from the mouth of God that he has value. He has value. Yeah. And every child does. Value. Every child does. And, and so you know, it's it's a great story. It's a story you're going to be able to tell for a good long time. Yeah. Um, and it's ever changing too. I mean, there's more of the story. I yeah. Think. That's what's so. I mean, it's cool. It's also scary yeah. as a parent. But um, Everett is going to evangelize some people. He already is. I mean, he uh, he has personality. I can see it in his face when he gets fussy or when he uh, when he doesn't like it when my hands are cold. I, I run cold naturally when. I touch him, he's like, come on, he kind of smacks me away. Sure. I warm up my hands and he's, he's cool with it. So yeah. like, there's already those little little yeah. things. And like you said before, um, if he was still in the womb, somehow that makes him lesser. That's what's so crazy to me. Doesn't make any sense to me. None. But that, that only solidifies um, my conviction in fighting for what I believe is right, even if it's not um, where most people are at. Well, I think I can show them that they've been misled by this false propaganda machine that is the Planned Parenthood and the Democrat Party allegiance, that somehow this is this is good for women when we know that there are people that regret it, that they have long-term mental health issues because of their, their decision to do so. A lot of them are compelled to do so. Now there's no mandatory reporting if it is um, the result of human trafficking. Uh, they, 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 that's not what these providers, abortion providers, are even told to do anymore. There, there is a, a point in which safe, legal, and rare 
now becomes taxpayer funded, mandated, and damn near celebrated. And that's where that's we're at. Right. That's exactly. So we, we need to we need to push back even against um, those in our own party who think that there's some sort of an electoral um, gain that can be made in in uh, going away from your own values. Well, and, and I'll just say, and then, and then we can kind of end it because yeah, we're, we have caucus. Here, we're late we're running caucus. Sorry, um, man. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Uh, but I don't, and this is the question I have for folks who are coming at us with this strategic electoral suggestion that we ought to be avoiding this issue or getting away from it. Uh, how does that work? Like, I don't yeah. understand functionally how we're going to get to a place where... What's the alternative? Well, first of all, they're not going to let us ignore it. Right. They're, you're going to get asked a question. Yeah, so you better have an answer. answer. Right. So you're going to have to have an answer, and your answer can't be, oh, I don't... That's not something I have any opinion on. Right. BS. It, it's like, it's, that's like saying you don't have an opinion on, on an issue that's presented. If, if you got into a car crash... Right. And somebody said, oh my gosh, how are you doing? Well, I don't want to address that. Yeah. Like, it's it's very, it, it's in your face. You have to address it, especially when the left is using it as a cudgel in sure. the elections. Um, to, to not have a stance on this is to say you don't have a moral conviction on something that everybody has a moral conviction right. on. And so we, we need to have an answer. And I think it's a heck of a lot better to say, Rather than just the outright abortion ban, we've all heard that. It doesn't change anybody's mind. It doesn't change anybody's hearts. It doesn't change anybody's values. Mm -hmm. If you tell them why, if you tell them why our position is morally righteous Uh and the left's, I mean, we we just ran through a bunch of things that that they believe with when it comes to abortion. Uh They're the extreme ones on this. And yet they say that we're the extremists. No way. I don't buy it. Not for a second. You're literally allowing non-citizens to come to Minnesota uh-huh. to receive an abortion uh-huh. with your money, with Minnesota taxpayers' do- dollars. That makes no sense to me. Right. I mean, it'd be like telling a, a, a lefty that we're, we're buying guns for non-citizens um, using the NRA's coffers, ta- taxpayer funded by you. Right, right. Like, they would hate that. They would be right. up in arms. They'd be protesting. They'd be rioting in the streets. But they're allowed to do it with, with ours. No, I'm not, I'm not going to fund or sit here and allow you to to fund something that is against my beliefs, against the very foundation of who I am as a, as a father, as a Christian, as somebody who believes something well, with, and, with and my money. That's and ridiculous. Something, and something that's frankly fundamentally unjust. I mean, yes. There's nothing, yes. There's nothing more fundamentally unjust than taking life. Yep. Innocent life. Yep. So, hey man, I appreciate you sharing the story. Let's get to caucus. All right. <laughs>